Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in this uh, virtual world. Thank you all for joining us today. I am the U.S. American Ambassador to Georgette Mossbacker, co-chair of the Three Seas Initiative at the Atlantic Council. I'd like to welcome you all to today's panel discussion, the Three Seas, the Road to Sophia Summit. And I don't think there could be a better place to discuss the impact of this initiative than the Delphi Economic Forum, an event dedicated to engaging political, economic, business, and academic leaders to deliver and promote innovative ideas for sustainable and competitive growth across Europe. The Three Seas Initiative, or 3SI, is just the kind of innovative idea this forum was designed to promote. For those who don't know the Three Seas Initiative, it's an effort by 12 Central and Eastern Europe member states to accelerate the development of cross-border energy, transport, and digital infrastructure in the region between the Baltic, Black, and Adriatic Seas. And phrase, three C's. The three C's initiative was launched in 2016 to catalyze greater economic growth, reinforce Europe's energy security through the diversification of supplies, strengthen Europe's economic resilience, and deepen the region's economic integration within Europe. By fostering regional connections to bolster infrastructure, and secure energy resilience and independence. This project is playing a key role in creating a Europe that is undivided, whole, secure, and prosperous. I have been closely involved with the initiative since its inception, and I'm thrilled to see how the 3SI has changed since its humble beginnings. Last year, marked important milestones in the initiative's evolution, including the launch of a fully operational Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund and a commitment by the United States to provide up to one billion in financing for Three Seas Initiative energy projects. As an American, I am proud to say that the Three Seas and more importantly, the mission the initiative seeks to accomplish, has buy-in at the highest level in the United States government. It is definitely a bipartisan effort. The Three Seas Initiative and Investment Fund both highlight and leverage the great economic potential of Central and Eastern Europe to the world. The Investment Fund has already invested in key sustainable energy and infrastructure projects. And as the size of the fund grows, so will the scale of the impact on the region. The Three Cs I Investment Fund brings an incredible growth opportunity to the Three C I project and marks a significant development in Three Cs lifetime. As it begins to identify specific projects in which it may uh, can invest. The fund presents a unique public-private partnership that may very well be the model for future development projects around the world. The leaders of the Three Seas Initiative countries soon will gather at the sixth presidential Three Seas Initiative Summit in Sofia, Bulgaria in July 2021 to discuss the progress and the prospects of the initiative. The summit will be accompanied by a business forum engaged in companies and stakeholders from the region with strategic foreign investors. As a Three Seas initiative in Tallinn in October 2020, Bulgari took over the coordinating role from Estonia at an important stage of the 3SI development. Bulgaria has voiced its intention to build on the momentum achieved so far, promote further implementation of cross-border and intra-regional projects, and consolidate 
3SI as a cooperative platform aimed at strengthened cohesion and conversion within the EU. The Summit and Business Forum provides a unique opportunity to stimulate interest in 3SI, engage companies and stakeholders from the region, and draw in potential investors in the project. With just two months to go before the Summit and Business Forum, this is the perfect time to reflect on the past successes of, of 3SI and discuss the way forward. I am joined today by a wonderful panel of experts from both the private and public sector to discuss the current state of the Three Cs Initiative, the Three Cs Initiative Fund, the successes so far, and the areas it most need of attention as we chart the path to the SOFIA Summit. Mr. Gavin Tate is the Chief Executive Officer of Amber Infrastructure Group. Amber, a long-standing commercial international infrastructure investment manager, serves as the investment advisor to the Three Cs Fund. As the investment advisor, Mr. Tate and his team at Amber advise the fund's development and management of its pipeline of infrastructure investment opportunities. Over the past 20 years, Gavin has built considerable experience leading the development and management of successful projects across the infrastructure spectrum, including in the energy, accommodation, transport, and utility sectors. Under his team's expertise, the investment fund has flourished in its first year of operation. Gavin provides a unique investor's perspective on the Three Cs initiative. Gavin, I can't wait to discuss the role, progress, and governing principles of the investment fund with you today. Asley I is the founder and chief investment officer of Lioness Capital, a policy and politically event-driven hedge fund based in New York and Washington, D.C. She has spent 16 years at the intersection of policymaking and markets, and she has global work experience and a rare blend of expertise in <clears throat> economic and public policy and regulatory issues. Asley provides an invaluable business perspective on the Three Cs initiative. Asley is, um, it is an honor and a personal honor, good friend, that you're joining us today. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the economic potential of the region. Finally, Minister Piotr Nominski currently serves as the Secretary of State in the Chancellery, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland for Strategic uh, Energy Infrastructure. He previously held the role of Deputy Minister of Economy and the head of the Office for State Prote uh, Protection and served as an advisor to the head of the National Security Bureau and a member of the Energy Security Team in the Chancellery of the President. Mr. Dominski brings not only a member government perspective on the three Cs, but particularly his expertise on energy and infrastructure security as well. Minister Kaminsky, who I've had the great honor and pleasure to work with, we look forward to hearing your perspective on the energy priorities of the Three Cs initiative. I can't thank you all enough for joining us here today, and I look forward to what I am certain will be a thoughtful and engaging conversation. I think to, um, we will uh, uh, kick off the questions and I would ask all of you to be as um, precise as you can so we can get as much in as possible. And of course, Minister Minsky, I will start with you. Uh, Poland has played an important leadership role in the three Cs. It has led the effort to stand up the Three Cs Fund and has made a significant investment in the initiative. Would you elaborate, please, on the geopolitical and geoeconomic objectives the, that motivated this unprecedented form of a Central European cooperation 
and the opportunity it presents the transatlantic community. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, 3CC was started by President Andrzej Duda and, uh, and President of Croatia at uh, uh, the first uh, uh, day of meeting. And uh, the idea uh, started with the assumption that uh, countries in uh, Central Europe, uh, starting from, uh, uh, from uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, up uh, or down rather on the map uh, to Croatia and others, uh, Balkan states, that we have something in common. We have in common the past, the past when the Europe uh, was divided and uh, we happened to be on the wrong side. Means that the, our dev economic development, social development, uh, national opportunities uh, were uh, simply uh, uh, under control of uh, of uh, Soviet Union at uh, that time, Russia, uh, if uh, I may say. And when we joined uh, uh, Western structures, means uh, uh, European Union and uh, NATO, of course, uh, some of us, uh, uh, we uh, were, in a sense, well behind those who were developing much faster, in, not only in economic sense, uh, on uh, being part of the Western world. So the idea of three C's initiatives, first uh, first point was based on the on the uh, uh, um, on the assumption that we can move faster together, just to achieve this. Uh, 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 this uh, platform, uh, equal platform for cooperation with uh, Western Europe and other Western world, because we were thinking, of course, from the very beginning uh, 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 about transatlantic uh, links. The other, I mean, second part of this uh, idea uh, covered and covers the uh, I mean, uh, the, the project uh, to form a, a group of countries able to have uh, its own uh, initiatives, uh, initiatives uh, which could be valuable for other uh, European states, for other transatlantic partners, for other partners in NATO, in uh, uh, for security reasons, uh, European Union uh, for economic reasons, and uh, uh, and uh, as I'm uh, stressing, transatlantic links uh, between Europe and the uh, United States and uh, Canada as well, uh, because we in Poland, we really think this is very deeply rooted uh, uh, sentiment and also knowledge that uh, without transatlantic links, it won't be possible to keep the uh, alliance which we used to call, to call Western alliance. And this is behind the idea, I mean, in a political sense, uh, 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 behind the idea of three C's initiatives. Uh, if we are talking about economic or uh, infrastructural uh, 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 part of this uh, uh, of this proposal, you know, we don't have enough links between ourselves because you know we we are being described and we describe ourselves as uh, uh, Central uh, European uh, countries, but uh, if we are are talking about, let's say, railroads or uh, autoroutes, uh, 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 highways uh, between Poland and Bulgaria, we don't see much of them. 
So the communication, transportation uh, cross uh, problems are to be solved in the region. And this is also the task for Three Cs initiative. Uh, the uh, uh, priority uh, projects which we have already on the table uh, um, between uh, our uh, three C's uh, colleagues, they cover those uh, infrastructural uh, 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 problems uh, uh, as well. Uh, you know, we are also able to communicate and to cooperate between uh, countries, uh, three C's countries, despite the difference, I mean, political differences, because uh, uh, as, it, as it is in democracy, uh, parties change, uh, they change, uh, and uh, elections are coming one by one, and uh, coalition, ruling coalition, they, they change, and still the presidents and the governments uh, in the region, they can meet each other and they can have common ground. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I have to just uh, uh, interject here since I did so much work with you on LNG and uh, as well as uh, civilian nuclear. Uh, I think that uh, Poland is truly a model for a coal burning country that has really taken aggressive steps to uh, go from coal to LNG as a bridge and to the green technologies, your offshore wind, uh, your solar, and now uh, the only known uh, way to get to carbon neutral is nuclear. And I applaud you for that. And I applaud Poland for that. Um, my next question is to Gavin Tate. Gavin, you've taken a, um, on a really critical role in the Three Seas Initiative. The fund you are managing is uh, the institutional core of the uh, effort. You are the key interface between the geoeconomic ambitions of the initiative and the private sector. Let us, uh, maybe you could tell us about the fund, its role and its objectives, its efforts to raise capital and uh, its pipeline of investments and potential investments. Excellent. I would be very happy to to answer those questions. So thank you once again. So, yeah, look, the, the, the fund was set up. It was established in uh, February of, of last year, um, just before COVID closed down most of Europe and indeed the world. And, and that timing uh, made, made the establishment of the fund challenging. If it weren't for, I think, all of the work that had been done um, prior to that by a number of the member countries of the three seas region. And indeed, I think what it did do was, was um, establish the credentials and the need for the fund even more. So just over a year on, the fund is just under a billion euros in size. There are nine countries currently participating in the fund and uh, the residual uh, countries are currently going through their due diligence process. Um, the overriding objective of the fund is actually relatively simple. Um, it's, it's to enable the governments of the region um, to work hand in hand, to, to work in partnership with the private sector. Um, to, I suppose it's to improve those, that, that infrastructure that we've just been talking about, that, the historical deficiencies in infrastructure which have, have been uh, well stated in in IMF and, uh, and and various other reports of being 600 billion, a trillion, depending on which report you 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 read, as to the level of the deficit in the three C's region in in the infrastructure world. Um, and then it's also to help, I suppose, the the infrastructure challenge that not just the three C's region are experiencing at the moment, but but also actually all countries around the world. It is that that transformation into the, the digital world, are, are, are countries connected with, with fast speed broadband sufficiently? Do they have data center networks? Energy, I suppose that, you know, there's, there's absolutely a focus on energy within the region and without. The transformation from what are now called dirty fuels 
coal in particular, to those transformational fuels, CCGT, hydrogen, and indeed renewables. Um, so the countries around the world are, are, are sharing many common challenges. And on the other side of the fence, you've got the private sector investors, particularly life funds and pension funds who traditionally get involved in funding the world's infrastructure, very often in partnership with, with governments. And those institutions are looking for a fair return. They're typically looking for long-term investments, 10, 15, 20 years type investments. And, and depending on, on where in the, in the risk spectrum the, 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 the particular fund or the particular investment sit, they'll probably have either um, a, 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 a link to GDP growth or, or they, they may be absolutely at the conservative end of the scale. Our particular fund, the Three Seas Initiative Fund, is targeting a 12 to 15% IRR for investors. So what we are intending to do is meet those geopolitical aims and objectives that we've just been hearing about with the commercial drivers, the commercial requirements of those private sector investors. And as you rightly say, Amber's role, and this is our, our seventh fund that we manage and we've been going for many decades now, it sits in between that. And our role is to find the investments that are exciting um, and that the, the, the effectively meet those commercial requirements of the fund and meet the, the investor returns required by private sector investors in the area. Now, we're focusing in on three particular uh, sectors, and that is the transport sector, the energy sector and the digital sector. And all three are effectively increasing the connectivity in the region. We're, we're particularly focusing on greenfield projects, so projects that are either in their construction phase, being constructed, or also those companies and assets that are already in existence, but actually are perhaps capex constrained. They need further investment to grow and meet their whole potential. And so where we are now, in the fund just over a, a year from when we first established it with the various member states is we made our first investment in the transport sector um, back in October, November of last year. And that is a company called Cargo Unit, which had a particular focus in, in Poland, but with ambitions um, to expand across the region. Um, Cargo Unit is a locomotive leasing company and it's particularly well focused because of those challenges that I was just referring to a moment ago, experienced by all countries, climate change. Mm -hmm. The EU, for example, um, and indeed many countries are now encouraging freight away from the road onto the rail network. And cargo unit should be very well placed to benefit from that transition. It has got an existing very strong management team. It's got existing contractor uh, con, um, client relationships, and it's also got um, significant growth ambitions, which by our investment into the company, we can help realize. Um, later on last year, December, we acquired a partially built um, data center in Estonia, which we are currently completing, which should be in uh, late summer of this year. And uh, once again, um, the characteristics of that particular platform, strong management and appetite to expand across the region. Um, we've also, and unfortunately I'm not able to talk um, fully about it um, today, but we've also signed our third investment uh, just recently, uh, which is a renewables platform, again invested in many countries across the region, um, both existing assets, which is important, but perhaps more important from our perspective, a very strong pipeline of uh, further renewable investments across the region. And that's what private sector investors are looking for. They're looking for where are the sectors that I can invest in um, and get an exciting level of return, but actually in, in platforms for growth. Um, those, those life companies and pension companies that I referred to earlier, because of where the risk-free rate is uh, in most of the world's economies at historical lows, infrastructure is, is typically there is a linkage between the risk-free rate um, in, in a number of the sectors. 
Um, and therefore, those companies are finding it challenging to meet their target levels of return. Uh, infrastructure is as popular as it has ever been, um, and you need new investments in new geographies. And there can be no better way for a private sector investor who has yet to have invested in the region to actually invest through the fund because they're looking to their left and their right and they're seeing the member states, the government, the development banks of the various countries investing beside them. They're seeing the strong participation and support of the US government, for example. Hopefully they're also seeing Amber Infrastructure, which is um, you know, a renowned uh, manager and developer of infrastructure assets for uh, a very long time and has got a uh, great track record in that. Also, Amber will be investing its own money beside them. So I think the potential um, of the fund is, is amongst the most exciting that I can see in infrastructure around the world today. And it's our job, along with everyone else who's, who's linked with the fund, to make sure that that potential is indeed realized. Thank you, Gavin. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, my opening question now is for Asley. And uh, Asley, you are an unbiased perspective on private capital in this uh, panel. And so um, what reactions have the fund generated from the private sector capital? And what actions can member states take to bolster the interest and the confidence of private investors in the fund? Well, I think, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Ambassador. Um, I, I do b believe that Gavin has, uh, has highlighted many of the most attractive uh, facets of this opportunity. Uh, I think it is very important uh, to highlight uh, the sheer, first of all, the sheer scale of uh, the GDP of the region. Uh, that it, if, you know, the, the 12 countries that make up the Three Seas region uh, consist of about, make up of about 25% of the EU population and 20% 20, 20 of the GDP. Uh, and this would con uh, roughly uh, correspond to a, the 12th largest GDP in the world. So the sheer scale is very important to highlight. And secondarily, it's important to highlight the growth potential of the region, which is expected to be uh, almost twice the level of uh, developed Western European countries for the next two decades. Uh, that is sort of, that sort of uh, highlights the investment return potential. Uh, I think it's very important from the angle of investment risk to highlight the relatively low um, uh, investment risk of the region. Uh, the region has, uh, uh, has is politically stable, secure, thanks to its transatlantic uh, you know, relationships, where of course the Three Seas Initiative comes into pl play. And not only that, it has low inflation, uh, it, is, um, it has relatively low unemployment, uh, macroeconomically stable, as I said, and it, it has a relatively high quality labor force that is reasonably well-educated. These things are very important uh, sort of aspects to highlight. I believe uh, that uh, the region has been largely overlooked in the last decade because uh, relative to other emerging markets, uh, mostly because China uh, has stolen the show. Uh, it, has, it had eye-watering growth levels, which I think sort of sucked the oxygen out of the room in the whole sort of global investment community for the longest time. But as we all know, uh, the China's uh, growth char characteristics are changing. The slow, uh, the growth is slowing down. Uh, the demographic uh, transformation driven by uh, its uh, migration of hundreds of millions of Chinese workers from rural to urban uh, areas uh, have, uh, have slowed down to a trickle. Uh, the Chinese wages are increasing. And most importantly, Chinese political risk have increased dramatically. Uh, Chinese government continues to uh, have put a lot of regulatory uh, hurdles uh, for investors, and uh, there are some obvious discriminatory practices against foreign investors in China. Um, I think all of these factors are, are, are should be used uh, in the argue in the 
arguments that are being made to investors that uh, Central Eastern Europe and particularly the Three Seas region have now become the next big thing to look at. Uh, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and its relative competitiveness to other emerging markets have increased. I think it's very important to highlight these factors repeatedly and consistently across all forums. Thank you, Asli. All right, I've got some general questions. Um, this one, uh, let's, uh, well, maybe Asli, you can do the, the actions needed by the three C's in, uh, initiative states. What should the leadership in the three C's member states do to make the world more aware of and more confident in the investment opportunities being driven in this area? Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are three things that the leadership of these countries can do. Um, the first thing that they should continue doing is to uh, advocate for a continuously, a continuous and consistently high transatlantic support uh, for all the investments in the region. That is very important because it provides the political shield and lowers the political risk of any investment in the region. That's number one. Um, the, uh, the second thing that they should do is increase their coordination across the region. This provides um, a, the scale that large investors uh, would, be, uh, would, uh, would prefer and would, uh, would increase their attention to the region. Gavin rightfully uh, highlighted uh, life insurance companies and uh, pension funds having the sort of duration preferences for, uh, that fit very well with infrastructure investments. It is, uh, it is quite correct, and, I, I, and I'm glad that the three funds, three C's um, fund is focusing on those type of investors. Uh, and obviously, these are very large institutional investors, and uh, they uh, literally uh, have trillions under management. And they prefer large-scale investments so that it is worth their time and effort to do the due diligence. So it is important to provide them with the type of investments that would fit their scale expectations. So political leaders in the region should increase their coordination. And I think that is exactly where the, what the Polish uh, minister was referring to. And I think it's exactly the right direction. Um, and uh, thirdly, I think it is important to highlight um, the, the particular focus of the Tree Seas Initiative. I think the core focus of energy, transportation, and digital infrastructure are exactly the right areas. Um, the, uh, on the inf energy side, clearly, um, we need to focus on uh, the type of... Um, uh, energy investments that provide reliable base load energy. And they are only coal, nuclear, and natural gas, as we all know. Coal is not preferable, and we are trying to uh, migrate out of it all over the world. And the best way to do this is to focus on natural gas, that is our transition fuel for the foreseeable future, and also nuclear. And I'm very uh, glad to hear that Poland is exactly taking the right decisions on that front because the uh, new generation nuclear plants are safe, reliable, and compact. And it is, uh, they have zero emissions. They're great. And uh, meanwhile, until we get to a much lower emission um, energy source, uh, natural gas, and particularly American natural gas, will be uh, the best transition fuel for the region and for the rest of the world. So I think from all points of view, from energy, transportation, and digital infrastructure, the Three Seas Initiative are exactly in the right sectors, and this should be highlighted to investors. Thank you. Gavin, um, what action can member states take to bolster the interest and confidence of um, private investments in the fund? Look, I think I think I think the establishment of the fund is a is a is a very practical demonstration of, of what can be done and, and what has been done. And um, it has allowed us as an investment manager to um, to start investing 
in projects ahead of the private sector investors coming into the fund. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is we, we've, we've been hearing about the, the, the trillions under management of, of private sector institutional investors, and that is indeed correct. The, the other side of that is all of these institutional investors have a, have a, a, a huge variety of options of, of where to deploy their investments. And it is always easier, whether it's institutional investors or, or any of us, to actually, if you've got a similar sort of investment that went well for you in the last five years, if you're going to put it up to your investment committee or up to your senior management, it's always easier to say, actually, this isn't new at all. That We did one of those sort of last year or the year before, and look, it performed okay. Um, the challenge when one comes to a new region uh, and a new sector is you have to get the airtime of those private sector investors, and you actually have to convince them this may take you a little bit longer to get your head around why you are investing in this region that to date you, for whatever reason, have decided to, to give a wide berth to. And that's why, you know, the focusing in of exactly as we were talking a, a moment ago there, Adley, on, on, on the economic benefits and the drivers and the historical growth and the future growth and actually the, the direct foreign investor returns coming out of the risk region being ahead of the rest of the EU, these are probably messages that, that the vast number of, of private sector investors haven't yet understood. And that's through no fault of their own because they're, they're focused in their own way. So from the country's perspective, I think it's more of the same. I think, I think you know, investors are going to hopefully invest through this fund. They're going to understand this is a fantastic region for growth and for investment. And then the key thing is that those invest the next investments they make, they may well be direct. So they so we're providing them with the comfort blanket of having the member states and the US government sitting beside them. Those next investments that they make into the region will hopefully be direct. And therefore, um, it is integral that the various member states keep the, the economic, the investment environment as attractive as possible. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Mr. P uh, Naminsky, Russia continues to be a significant, if not dominant, supplier of oil and gas to the Three Seas region. What role can the Three Seas Initiative and Investment Fund play in strengthening energy sovereignty in the region? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, Frankly speaking, I, I'm not sure whether it touches directly uh, 3C's investment fund, but uh, it uh, touches for sure our Polish strategy uh, uh, of uh, diversification of sources and routes of, of supplies. Uh, first, gas. We are still dependent on uh, Russian uh, contract, uh, which will expire by 2022, end of the year, and uh, and uh, we are on a very good way to complete uh, our projects, which is uh, Baltic Pipe. This is pipe and connecting Poland with Norwegian Shelf, and uh, actually last uh, uh, week we visited uh, the special ship lying the undersea uh, sections of, uh, of pipelines uh, in Rotterdam and this ship will enter Baltic uh, very soon and uh, I may say that this uh, uh, C-section of the whole transportation uh, routing uh, will be completed uh, this year, uh, I mean uh, physically uh, formally, it will uh, be next year, 2022. Also, the terminal, LNG terminal in Finnoistia, which is operating, which, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, used uh, for, uh, uh, between others, uh, LNG contracts uh, uh, with uh, American uh, companies. Uh, and it goes on. Uh, it's being expanded. So, uh, so by 23, we'll have uh, uh, 
50% more capacity in Świnoujść uh, and then uh, floating unit in uh, Gdańsk. So, uh, you see, in 20s, uh, mid 20s, will be uh, completely independent from this uh, Russian dominant uh, position. Thank you. Thank you. That's a brilliant idea. And one I hope that uh, we can take up at our next meeting because I think that is certainly worth worth looking at. And I don't think that most people realize how many engineers graduate from Poland every year. It has the biggest output of engineer graduates. And the other thing I think I would like to highlight is the fact that uh, and you, you, you just mentioned it, but this is, in my opinion, a big deal that Poland will be energy independent from Russia in another year. I mean, there's very few countries who can say that. I think that's very, very impressive. Asli, tell me, um, what should the leadership in the three C's member states do to make the world aware and um, more confident in the investment opportunities uh, being driven by this effort? I think um, um, Poland has an admirable, rational energy policy. And I think it's a great story to tell as an example to other countries. Um, as we all know, um, politically uh, in the United States at the moment, the administration cannot be more focused on uh, green infrastructure. Uh, this is as, uh, as good as it gets in the United States. And as we all know, European leaders have been focused on this issue for a long time. Uh, and I would say that if um, if the uh, po the political polls are correct, and uh, in September elections that Greens get more power in a potential coalition in the German government, the uh, the intensity of uh, of green energy uh, investments and potential for subsidies will increase in Europe. The reason I'm telling you all this is is because it really fits into the overall global uh, narrative to invest in energy infrastructure. And I think it is a good time to talk about the story and particularly the policies that Poland have pursued. That's, I think, is uh, number one. Number two, I think it is important to highlight that the region, the three seas region, have, um, um, have a sort of a predictable, rules-based, uh, investor-friendly uh, climate. Uh, and this is important uh, because uh, political uh, uh, volatility and uh, in unpredictability in terms of tax and regulatory policies repel investors. And if you are a life insurance company or a pension fund with fiduciary duties to your investors for the next 30 years, the, uh, your prediction about the consistency of these policies are very important. I think the leaders should uh, deliver these messages to uh, investors of all uh, asset classes and uh, that this, uh, these policies are there and they're going to be consistent and they're going to be continuously investor friendly for the foreseeable future. I, uh, I think that is probably, as the, um, I would agree that that is maybe the cornerstone uh, to the success of the three C's. Uh, it, to be a private-public partnership, uh, it's got, uh, capital goes where it's wanted, where it's friendly, where there are policies that uh, give it uh, confidence. And um, I think uh, and that can only be done at the government level. Gavin, um, what reactions have the fund generated from the private sector uh, capital markets to date? Yeah, thank you. Uh, a huge amount of interest. Um, that, that our strategy all along, and indeed the, the one that was set out um, prior to us getting involved, was 
was spend the first year or so making sure all of the countries, we, we got as many countries as possible involved in the fund. And as I mentioned a moment ago, so nine, nine of the countries are now invested. The DFIs, such as uh, the DFC in, in the US, are extremely important to um, the overall story for private sector investors as well. Private sector investors, if they're trying to do something new and trying to invest in a new region, do find comfort from, from such DFIs being alongside them. Um, so our role at the moment, we're out talking to hundreds of uh, potential private sector investors, um, and that process will go on throughout uh, this year. Obviously, it is more challenging doing that uh, virtually than it would have been had COVID uh, not closed down the world as it had done. But I think actually those key messages that we've been talking about earlier today, people are, are, are waking up to um, what potential um, lies in the region. And I think also um, the fact that we have managed to successfully invest in what are extraordinary assets in all three sectors of digital transport and energy, and uh, hopefully within uh, a couple of weeks or so, we'll be able to talk fully about all three of those investments. Once again, that is hugely attractive to the private sector, rather than discussing a, a theoretical fund, looking at a, a, a document of this is what the fund can invest in, this is what it can't. There's nothing better than actually having, setting out your shop window, I suppose, which investments have you done, and that you can talk through that. And that provides investors who've yet to invest in a region a great deal of, of, of confidence, I suppose, about actually this is a commercial fund. I can see that this, these, these investments aren't political by any means. These investments have been made to, uh, to create that commercial uh, return. Um, one of the questions that a number of the private sector investors quite understandably ask, and it is probably in the top five, is I can see that you know, a number of the countries have invested a huge amount of money into the fund, which is great from a support perspective, but where does that place them in, in entitlement to influence the investments of what types of investments the fund is able to make? Um, and so I think it is worth restating now how, how actual investment decisions are made. It is a purely independent process. There is a independent investment committee that has five members sat upon it. Two of those are uh, from Amber Infrastructure, so myself um, and my chief investment officer, Amanda Woods. Um, there are also um, a member from the Luxembourg-based manager, um, Fuchs, um, as well as two independents who were selected um, by Amber. So there are no country representatives uh, sitting on the investment committee. And I think it is those um, the, the, that level of understanding, our, okay, it is commercial, as well as backed up by seeing actually a huge amount of money has already been deployed in what are very exciting um, opportunities that are showing already great growth potential. So it is those, those um, um, building blocks, those foundation stones that we are laying to bring in private sector investment, hopefully later on this year and indeed next year. We've got a five year period where we'll basically be raising and deploying money. So we've got, uh, we're, we're in this for the long term. We're looking for to raise um, three to five billion euros is the target. So there is plenty of time um, both to raise money and indeed to spend it. Gavin, what would you say is the number one uh, issue that you are faced with when uh, pitching these uh, these projects to the private sector? I would I would say it's principally airtime. I think particularly in the COVID world that we're we're working on, um, that everybody is intensely busy. Everybody has. Um, the, the one thing that hasn't slowed down over the COVID period is infrastructure, I would suggest. Um, infrastructure activity has been as busy as ever. There have been as many acquisitions and, uh, and, and funds raised and funds spent um, as there has ever been. 
Um, and so when you, you know, this fund is a, a new kid on the block, you know, I believe, and I think those when they actually come and have the time to spend to understand the fund, believe it is arguably one of the most exciting infrastructure innovations around the world anywhere. But actually, you've got to get the airtime of that. You've, you've got you. The, the, there is a reason those investors have not yet invested in the region, um, and you've therefore got to overcome um, preconceptions, which which you know are, are often incorrect. Um, and you've got to sit through um, and work through you know the positives um, and indeed the, the you know some of the negatives. What are the challenges that you have overcome? How have you overcome them? Um, but as I mentioned, you know, before, there is no better way than actually that practical demonstration of actually these are the investments and these and here is how they have performed since we we have invested in them. Um, and these are the next steps. I think the pipeline of opportunities we've now reviewed, gosh, I think over 130 separate opportunities across the region. Um, there is no shortage of, of opportunities. And that is probably the most exciting thing. We are in a, um, a relatively luxurious position uh, to be able to pick and choose what, you know, what are the investments that we, re we really do back. We've also got the huge advantage of having um, um, an astonishing level of access into each of the member states who in the region. Um, and the ministries there have been enormously helpful in, in, in helping us and uh, uh, and, and, and directing us, okay, this is where we think the next next big area is. And we have been involved in those discussions as well. I've said, okay, that probably isn't going to be quite ready for the fund, but actually something like this may well be. So there's been that, you know, it's been a genuine private public partnership and, and working together. So it, it is tremendously exciting. Uh, Asley, uh, what particular infrastructure projects in Central and uh, Eastern Europe capture your interest as a manager of a um, policy-driven investment fund? Oh, well, thank you, Ms. Ambassador. I, I think it is fair to say that all three areas that the fund focuses on are very exciting for us. Um, the natural gas pipelines and the interconnections are clearly uh, key. Uh, not only for the energy sec security of the region, but also um, for uh, from an investment return point of view, is uh, something that is well played in developed markets in the U.S. and in Europe, and therefore it is it has a lot of precedence that uh, gives us the sort of the confidence to uh, to uh, look uh, into. Uh, secondarily, um, the um, the investments into electricity grids that would allow integration with the Western European markets are great. Again, uh, this is an area that is well played out in other developed economies. And, uh, and as Gavin suggested and rightfully highlighted, the, the investment gap of, uh, in the three seas region relative to Western Europe in these areas are, are, are huge, uh, close to a trillion euros, according to one IMF report. And therefore, uh, that, those areas shows that there's an incredible opportunity and a return potential. And finally, I think it, it, it is important to also highlight the, the, the digital infrastructure that is of interest. The 5G, the, the deployment of 5G networks in the United States are, are going at the fastest as possible. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is an area of growth all around the world. And therefore, investors are particularly focused into this area. And uh, as the fund uh, comes up with more um, investments that uh, you know long-term investors can deploy capital to, I think it was going to create a conversation that's going to be very beneficial for investors, for the fund, and obviously for the region. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, Minister Naminsky. I really think believe, Mike is I really believe that digital sector is probably the most promising because this is the future. And uh, we need digital uh, investments specifically in cyber security side if we want to keep those uh, transmission infrastructure uh, or infrastructures uh, like uh, uh, like energy infrastructure really alive. Uh, 
so uh, and also I think that projects uh, in the digital sector can be can be divided in smaller pieces more I mean I know that we are thinking about big institutional investors and big big projects but for the beginning uh, almost at the beginning probably smaller pieces could be useful and it's not easy to divide you know uh, let's say transmission pipeline into pieces or uh, or electricity grid but we, if you are thinking about uh, investment into digital sector it is much more feasible thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think there is a consensus of the importance of the digital sector with respect to being able to compete, frankly. Um, is there any other comments anyone would like to make before we wrap this up? We only have a few minutes left. Um, I thank you all for participating. I just have a couple closing comments. Um, I will say that um, I really um, appreciate Minister Kaminsky and Gavin and Masley. Thank you for sharing your perspective on the Three Seas Initiative. Your leadership in driving this initiative forward from your respective positions of government, the Three Seas Fund and the private capital markets actually is very essential to the success of the three C's. Let me close with one um, personal point. And that is, as um, one who has served as the EU ambassador to Poland, I see the three C's initiative as an important, if not unprecedented, act of self, of uh, regional self-initiative and self-confidence to leverage the geoeconomic potentials of Central and Eastern Europe, to create economic opportunity and strategic value for itself and the wider transatlantic community. And I do believe that this is a public-private partnership has a real opportunity to be a model. The the issues we deal with today are quite frankly too big for either the public sector or the private sector to, um, to accomplish on their own. We have to find a way to work together. And um, of course, these projects have to be um, uh, set up so that they do have a competitive rate of return. I think that's very possible. I think that's what Gavin Tate is working on. And I think that's what Asley believes. Um, and I also think, uh, and I will beat this drum, that we do need a secretariat. Uh, I, am, I am the last person in the world who appreciates, no, it's the wrong word. Uh, I truly believe in a bureaucracy is driven by uh, by um, um, by uh, uh, not by results, uh, and uh, it's by process. And so, uh, I think this could be set up small office, maybe no more than five people. But to be realistic, people have some have to have some place to call to ask questions about what, where projects are, what is happening, um, answer those kind of questions. Uh, the first thing any of us does in our life, and, and I'm sure that's true of everyone uh, today, is the first thing we do when we're about to uh, uh, do any business is we Google. We Google the firm, we Google the people, we Google the... We ask the uh, frequently asked questions. And um, I think this is, I know this has been difficult because look, nobody wants to add to bureaucracy. 
but this doesn't have to be that. And um, but it, we do need to formalize this and to brand it. I still find after this many years, people asking me, what is the Three C's Initiative? Well, by now, we need to brand this so that we are building an excitement around it that attracts uh, public capital. So having said uh, that, I will end this by, uh, again, thanking our very distinguished panel. It's very interesting. Thank you for your support of the three C's and um, look forward to seeing you at the uh, next conference. Thank you, God bless. Thank you.